For over a thousand generations, the Jedi Knights were the guardians of peace and justice in the Old Republic, as Luke Skywalker was told by Obi-Wan Kenobi not long before the Battle of Yavin. At various points in their shared history in fact, the Jedi and the Republic might as well have been synonymous considering how closely they worked with each other. But how did this arrangement begin? How did the Jedi Order come to serve the Republic? In this video, the second installment in our series on Republic history will be exploring just that. Attention, Sergeant on deck! When we left off at the end of our previous video, which discussed the settling of the core in the Unification Wars, the year was 25,053 BBY and the Galactic Republic had just been founded. Over the course of the next few decades, it began to solidify and explore more of the galaxy. Historians consider this the start of the Expansionist Age, a roughly 5,000 year period of history that marked the earliest period of the Republic's development. During this first leg of that period, the Core Worlds were explored a bit more, with routes in the Arrowhead region being made more reliable and stray systems in the region being added to the charts here and there. Meanwhile, the Republic also began to expand into the colonies, the region just outside of the Core Worlds. Over the course of the Republic's next first centuries, a wide swath of the region was opened up, with Nemoidia, Katada, Komenor, Kalida, Byblos, Karida, Uviu Exen, and Arcania all joining the Republic during this time. The first years of the Republic also saw the blazing of the first of the Republic's most crucial hyperspace routes. In the southwest, Corellians and Duros blazed the start of a route that, thousands of years later, would become the Corellian trade spine. In the southeast, the Corellians extended the spin, the route between Corellia and Coruscant, into the start of the Corellian run, which by 24,500 BBY had reached Iseno and Denon, two worlds in the inner rim that would become rich and powerful in later years. But the work of the Corellians couldn't compare to the sheer luck of the Polemians. Polemia was a small shipyard world located on the Axis, a route that stretched from Coruscant to Raltir, connecting some of the most powerful core worlds. The Polemians worked to extend the route, pushing it northeast into the unknown, and they struck gold. Between the founding of the Republic and 25,000 BBY, in just 53 short years, these mad lads pushed what would become the Polemian trade route all the way into the Outer Rim. Along the way, they discovered a number of soon-to-be important systems, including Yabul Opa, Castel, Tyran, Tanab, Lantils, Roche, Abhin, Liana, and eventually Kolomux. The Republic explored a bit of the space near Kolomux, and in 25,000 BBY, they discovered Ossus, where they made their first official contact with the Jedi Order. The Jedi Knights, the followers of the light and defenders of the balance of the force, were one of the most ancient organizations in the galaxy. The foundations of the Jedi Order were laid in 36,453 BBY, when the Thoyor, a mysterious collective of ships that resembled Mortis, gathered force sensitives from all over the galaxy and brought them to Tython, a world deep in the core. Tython was exceptionally strong in the force and those beings who were brought there by Tho Yor dedicated their lives to its study, naming themselves the Jedi. For over 10,000 years, the Jedi of Tython studied the Force, but the peace of that idyllic world was shattered a few centuries before the formation of the Republic. Originally, the Jedi had studied both the Light and the Dark, which they referred to as the Ashla and the Bogan. But over time, members of the Order began to drift toward one side or the other. Most of the Jedi gravitated toward the Ashla, the light side, as they came to recognize that balance in the Force was only achievable through its supremacy, but others, influenced by the Rakata, gravitated instead toward the Bogan, believing it would grant them greater power. The two sides clashed in the Force Wars of Tython, which lasted for about a decade. The followers of Ashla eventually defeated the followers of Bogan, and in the aftermath of the conflict, they formed the Jedi Order, 
dedicated to ensuring the supremacy of the light and thus the balance of the force. But despite the Jedi victory, the force wars took their toll on Tython. Since the planet and its ecosystem was so heavily attuned to the force, the force wars wreaked havoc across its surface and the Jedi were forced to abandon it, as it was barely even inhabitable at that point. Using Rakatan force-attuned hyperdrives, they traveled across the galaxy and settled on Ossus. Ossus was a unique world that reminded the Jedi of Tython in its prime, a world of natural beauty and astrological uniqueness. Located in the Adiga system, Ossus had two sons, Adiga Prime and Adiga Besh, and unusually, it orbited them in a figure-eight pattern. When the Republic discovered Ossus in 25,000 BBY, they made their first official contact with the Jedi Order. The Jedi Knights had been known to the Republic beforehand, as a few had fought in the Unification Wars, but they were mostly treated as beings of legend, and it wasn't until contact was made with Ossus that the legends were confirmed. While their basic precepts were the same, the Jedi Order of 25,000 BBY was quite different from the Jedi Order of the movie era. The Jedi were always in favor of the light side. Their high council was in place from the beginning and their ranks and many of their traditions were present in the earliest incarnations of the order. But in general, the Jedi order of those times were far less rigid than it would eventually become. The ancient Jedi were allowed to have families, for example, and their temple on Ossus was less of a headquarters and more of a gathering site. Furthermore, they had not yet invented their iconic lightsabers Instead, they used specially forged swords imbued with the Force, which made them sharper, more durable, and more in tune with the user. Some Jedi welcomed ties with the Republic and immediately began traveling to Republic worlds, seeking to maintain peace and justice. Others were more skeptical, however, so the Order debated whether or not to officially join the Republic for weeks. But ultimately, after a verd Jedi Master Huan Tia toward the Republic and was satisfied with what he saw, the Order did in fact choose to officially ally itself with the Republic. From that point forwards, the Jedi Knights served as the guardians of peace and justice across the Republic, a role they would continue to fulfill in various ways for the next 25,000 years. Many Jedi settled on worlds across the Republic as permanent protectors and sages, becoming Jedi Watchmen, while Others largely remained on Ossus, which became a fortress world of the Republic, serving to protect it from the threats of the Outer Rim. But ironically, the first real threat to the Republic that the Jedi fought off came from within the Jedi Order itself. By 24,500 BBY, the Jedi Order had comfortably settled into its place in the Republic and its various doctrines became more rigid. The Jedi Council in particular was becoming more dogmatic, especially when it came to studying other Force traditions. A number of Jedi resented this, including one promising student named Zendor. Hoping to solve the problem, Zendor and his close friend Arden Lin asked the Council for permission to start a satellite academy far from Ossus, where they would study a variety of other Force traditions alongside the Jedi ways. The Council shot this idea down, but Zendor and Lin left to start their satellite academy anyway, taking a large number of followers with them. They settled on Leto, a world on the borders of the Deep Core that was pretty much on the opposite end of the Republic. On Leto, Zendor founded an academy where he was quickly joined by thousands of Jedi renunciates and other Force sensitives. They operated similarly to the Jedi but with a much less rigid hierarchy and a strong emphasis on individualism in contrast to what they viewed as the collectivist ways of the Jedi. At first, Zendor's teachings were a mix of a wide variety of Force traditions, but they gradually became dominated by the study of the Bogan, the dark side of the Force. Zendor and his followers became enthralled by the darkness, as the Jedi Council had feared. So, the Jedi began gathering on Ossus, fearing Zendor would become a threat to the Republic. In turn, Zendor and his followers began to militarize, naming themselves the Legions of Leto. As the Jedi began openly building an army in Ossus, Zendor, now the general of the Legions of Leto, believed war was inevitable. Hoping to end it before it began, he struck first, launching an attack on Ossus that the Order easily repelled. 
The Jedi beat the legions of Letal back to the Polemian in short order, bringing the war to the core worlds, the heart of the fledgling Republic. This war became known as the First Great Schism. Battles were fought between the Jedi and the legions of Brentul IV, Trandrila, Korolag, Metalos, and even Coruscant itself. The outcome of these battles is unknown, but it can be assumed the Jedi won all or most of them. And though both the Jedi and the legions claimed that they were trying to defend the Republic, the Republic generally stayed out of it. In short order, the Jedi Knights pushed the legions of the Polemian down the Corellian run, cornering Zendor on Colimus, a world that was close to Leto. On Colimus, Zendor and some of his best legionnaires, including the likes of Sethil Asiage and Tun Bohoi, stood against the armies of Adrista Pina, nicknamed the Green Blade, the leader of the Jedi armies and a legendary warrior. Zendor and the legions fought well, but the Jedi had a crucial advantage, one that allowed them to win the prior battles of the Schism, Battle Meditation. That rare Jedi technique allowed generals like Pina to coordinate entire armies through the Force, and in the First Great Schism, his forces surrendered themselves entirely to his direction, creating a sort of battle meld that allowed the armies of the Jedi to fight as a singular unit. Zendor and his followers were disgusted by this, viewing it as insectile and a surrendering of individuality, and refused to do the same. As a result, they were slaughtered, and Zendor himself died at Pina's hands. The Jedi then launched an attack on Leto, in which Zendor's academy was destroyed, as were most of his followers. Only Arden Lin, his right hand, escaped, fleeing into the unknown, into which Adrista Pina pursued her. Neither were seen or heard from for the next 25,000 years, and with the destructions of the legions of Leto, the First Great Schism came to a close. The conflict was more or less forgotten in short order. Even though it was technically a full-scale war, it was quite small in scale, as both the Jedi Order and the Legions of Leto were only a few thousand strong each, and the battles between them were small and quick. The Republic pretty much ignored the whole thing, while the Jedi willfully let it fade into legend. By the time of the Clone Wars, it was pretty much a myth. Only Zendor's name was remembered from the period, and even then, it was remembered only as profanity, an ignoble legacy for a guy who really wasn't all that bad. In the aftermath of the First Great Schism, the Republic kept expanding and the Jedi kept protecting it, righting small-scale wrongs and generally ensuring safety and stability. However, only a few hundred years later, the Jedi would be caught into action en masse once more as the Republic faced its first real threat, the TNEs. But that's a story for another day, namely the day when we put out the next video on the history of the Republic. So what do you think of the First Great Schism and of this series? Feel free to let us know in the comments section below. And just before you go guys, as per usual, make sure you check out some of those links in the description below if you want to join the wider Geetsleys community on our Discord, where you can chat to other Star Wars fans and myself, our Geetsleys Gaming Network, where you can play games with other Star Wars fans, and the Patreon if you want to help support the channel more than you already are by watching these videos. Anyways guys, thanks for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.